Um, <clears throat> I, I'm excited to be here today. I am excited because I, this is a, a, a major passion of mine. Um, uh, I've had to address lots of different issues in life relative to weight or health, more importantly. Um, and so I, it, it's something that I like to be able to share with others. You're going to hear my strong biases today because I don't know how not to do it. <laughs> and um, one of my strong biases are there is no such thing as evil food. Um, we treat some foods evilly. Um, chocolate's not evil, but when we overconsume it, it's evil. Um, and so I'm, everything in its, in, its, in its proper proportion is okie doke. Um, and so that, that's, that's the assumption that I'm operating from. I used to weigh 320 pounds. Um, at 320 pounds, I had a, um, a cholesterol that was over 300. Um, the day that I walked into the doctor to talk to, to talk to him about some other issues I was having with feet and stuff, um, he took my blood sugar. He asked me, uh, first I said, what, you're taking my blood sugar, you think I'm a diabetic, what? He said, well, let's just humor me, let's just try it. My blood sugar on that particular day was over 450. A normal blood sugar is 80 to 120. Um, at the time, we took an A1C, which is a measurement of your blood sugar over time, um, or your ability, your ability to deal with blood sugar over time. My A1C on that day was 13. I just looked at those labs. A normal blood sugar is below 5.7. Um, today, I, my cholesterol is 127. My last A1C was a 5.9. Um, I run red blood sugars regularly in the 80 to 120, which is all, all normal, normal. That doesn't happen by chance. We well, just can't flip a coin and hope that everything's going to turn out okay because we need to know what's going on. That's, and and that's, my, that's my whole premise today. You can't do better in making good choices unless you know what you're choosing or know, or know what it is that you're consuming or know what you're putting in. So I'm telling you the way that I first got a handle on that is I wrote down every single thing I put in my mouth. Now I was not the kind of person that walked into somebody's office and they had a little candy this year, I'd just grab a piece of candy. I had to write a note real quick and put that on uh, and keep that with me so that I'd be able to record everything. I, did. I had little pieces of tissue and sales receipts and crap all over in my clothing because until you, can, you can't control what you do not know. So know first, always know what it is you're consuming. If you're, the, if you're the provider of food for your families, that's harder because you're having to taste. You're having to just, and as a chef, that's also a problem for me is because I'm having to taste, I'm having to know what's going on. But making sure that I'm keeping track of what it is I'm consuming is the first, the, the first battleground. Today we're going to talk about a couple different recipes. I'm going to show you that make, can make a difference, not necessarily just because it's a great recipe, because they both are, but because it, it's a philosophy, it's a philosophy <coughs> change maybe. And the first one is this. Who, who's ever had um, lettuce wraps at P.F. Chang's? They rock, don't they? Aren't they so dang good? Did you know that one serving of lettuce wraps at P.F. Chang's is supposed to be for two people? Whatever. <laughs> exactly what I thought. Uh, it's supposed to be for two people. And how many calories is that per serving? And that's two servings now. Half of the dish. Half of the dish. 850 calories. That's more than just your meal. And that's your appetizer? We're going to do lettuce wraps this morning. You can have three of these for, what does it say in that recipe real quick? Has the service size? For how much? For how many wraps? It should. Three wraps each. Three wraps for 100 and how many calories? Just say that to P.F. Chang's 850. Um, PF chick, it's almost all meat. The only thing, other thing you have in there besides meat is um, water chestnuts and very heavily sugared sauces <laughs> and fat. Those are all problems with it. So we're gonna we're gonna do a lettuce wrap that I think has as good a flavor pl profile as you're gonna have at PF Chang's, but it utilizes some of the things that contribute to the flavor without having to go with sugared sauces and lots and lots of protein. Okay. So we're going to start with this, this wrap. One thing, you know, we're going to start with a little bit of, I think your recipe says I'm using olive oil, and then I think it has chili flakes that we're adding afterwards. I prefer actually to use uh, a chili oil, 
The chili oil gives me both those things and disseminates a little bit, a bit, a bit of heat a little further. So I don't, uh, you can do it the way it says in, in, in the recipe. I just would rather use a little chili oil than I would the flakes. Okay, then I'm gonna add to that a little chopped garlic. Chili oil now can be found in almost every grocery store. Pardon me? Um, I've got it at Macy's, I've got it at Smith's, I've got it at just about any place that you can think of it. Uh, you can, you're you're either going to find it in where you have Asian foods, or you can find it where they have oils, usually both places. Okay, a little chopped garlic goes in there, and then this is just grated ginger, all right? Those are, these are the, the beginnings of what we call aromatics. Aromatics are the ones that, you know, that provide aroma. <laughs> I know it's a hard thing to get that one together, right? And then I'm adding to that some chopped green onions, okay? Are carrots an aromatic? Do this. Okay, thank you so much. Um, onions, carrots, celery are also aromatics, all right? But you, we tend to think of those ones that are a little more pungent. Gingers, garlic, things of that nature. So we're going to start here with, with putting those, these... Usually I don't try to throw those on the floor. Um, and now, since I already have my oil, my chili oil in, I'm going to add just a little bit more olive oil um, so that I can make sure that I'm not going to burn this on the bottom without having to add some more heat because I don't know how many of you guys really like heat and how many of you don't. And so we're trying to get somewhere in the middle. This was mine. I just used straight chili oil the entire time because I don't care if it peels leather or not. All right, we're gonna go ahead and let those cook for a minute. The next thing you're gonna do is, according to your recipe, again, I, I, I hate to tell you I'm making changes, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna screw with the recipe you have because that's somebody else's recipe. I just played with it a little bit, okay? Um, it, I do, I soak chicken overnight in a little bit of straight soy and garlic. Why do I do that? And it doesn't say that in your recipe at all. Why do I do that? Because it gets in better. It gets in better. I cut up that chicken, I go ahead and soak it overnight, and then and this and I have actually already cooked so that we could um, expedite the process today. But uh, when I cook it, I don't cook it in that, obviously. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stir fry it outside of the liquid, okay? When I say the word stir fry, what does that really mean? If you're doing it and saying it in Chinese, you'd be saying the word chowing. Um, I usually hate fry pans or electric woks. The reason that I do is because fry pans and electric woks aren't really stir frying because we control the heat. <laughs> we tend to want to say, okay, well, it's a little too hot and I don't know how fast I can do this, so I'm going to turn it down. The minute you turn down um, the, the chowing process, the cooking process that is stir frying, you eliminate the real processes that have to do with the sear on the vegetable or, or meat or whatever you're doing. Now you start to steam the food because the temperature is too low. I want this sucker as high as it can get. I, want, I just want to make sure that I don't leave it there by itself, right? You're, like I said, you're going to hear my strong biases today, and my strong biases are also this. If we wait in life, to address issues that have to do with our health, our fitness, our, those things that are most important to us. If we wait until it's convenient, if we wait till we don't have any stress in life, if we wait until uh, I don't have kids at home, if we wait until I'm not doing, if we wait, every moment that you wait, you provide yourself with the opportunity to kill yourself a little quicker. I don't know how to say that any, when I, I told you when I went to the doctor, I went to the doctor because when I weighed 320 pounds, I went to the physician because I am a really vain person. <laughs> Anybody who knows me at all would say, oh my gosh, yes, yes. Um, I had, I have an issue with my feet. My feet are too thick, almost an inch too fat this way. And I've always had people to me say, oh, you have a high end step. Well, no, it's meat all the way through, babe. It's not a high end step. And because they're fat, fat that way, I can't usually go buy a slip-on shoe ever. My, fat, my foot's just too, too thick. And I went to the store and I found this pair of shoes that I loved. It was a slip-on, it was a dance gun, and obviously they fit, I got my foot into it. 
That was not smart. Um, I wore those shoes for the first time for um, almost 16 hours straight. And at the end of that 16 hours, I couldn't feel the tops of my feet on either foot. Um, and I knew I needed to go get it looked at, so two years later I did, because my wife made me. I'm a guy, what the crap did you expect? Um, and so I went to the, the doctor and I told him, I said, I have an issue, I can't feel the tops of my feet. And, I said, and he said, well, what do you think that's from? And I said, well, it's from these shoes I wore. There's a permanent ridge in both feet from 16 hours. I mean, that's still there. I have this little bump that goes across both feet. I said, so um, because I have that, I'm sure that, that I've killed nerves or something in my feet. I just want to make sure. And he said, well, have you, have you looked to see if there's anything else that could be complicating this? I have, uh, my, in my education process, a, a pretty good amount of nutrition and and an and fizz and some other stuff. And I said, are you trying to say am I diabetic? No, dude, I'm not a diabetic. He said, well, just humor me. He took my blood sugar. It was 400, 450. Normal blood sugar is 80 to 120. He said, oh, my gosh, you might be a borderline diabetic. I said, no, dude, borderline diabetic is 180. I'm well past borderline. He said, so, um, he said, well, we need to get you on some medication. Um, he wanted, and I said, I really don't want to do drugs. I don't want to do medication. I don't, it's not something that uh, I subscribe to personally. I hate meds for the most part. And he said, well, um, well, what do you propose that we do? And I said, I propose that you allow me first of all to see if I can address weight issues and eating issues. And then I said, well, let me come back in three months and let's take, let's reevaluate what I'm, what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. I said, but if you give me a glucometer, I'll monitor my blood sugars. And then I went and got some diabetes education. I did some other things to make sure I understood what was going on, made sure that my, that my knowledge base was good. When I came back in three months, I'd lost 65 pounds. Yeah, too fast, thank you so much. But um, he, when I left, my physician looked at me and I knew that he said, oh, there goes a fat man that's not gonna do one dang thing about his health. He'd seen too many other fat men do that. I lost 65 pounds. Um, it was actually closer to four months when I went to go see him again. And he said, wow, you really, you really are addressing it. I said, yeah. He said, well, how are you doing it? I said, well, I'm exercising. <laughs> I'm exercising. <laughs> and I'm watching what I'm eating. I, like I said, I, my first strategy was to make sure I wrote down everything I put in my mouth. That was hard for me because I'm a chef. And People are always bringing things into my office to say, Mike, will you, che will you check this? Will you taste this? Will you do? That's hard. Especially when my attitude was, yeah, I'll test your pie. Just leave it there. <laughs> and a good test size is about a pie. It's kind of my attitude. No, I will eat a dozen donuts. That's a good portion size for me, unless two dozens available. Or I'll eat a bowl of M&Ms or I'll eat a bowl of M&Ms. It depends on what's available. I have issues with consumption of sugar. It's something that I do not handle well. I like the sweet, I like, there's, I like food, period, but especially not that. I, it's a very hard thing for me to, to shut off. So I knew I had to take control of that in my life. I never would ever expect anybody else to do what I did. I stopped consuming sugar. I, don't, I didn't do it again. I still don't consume sugar, concentrated sweets, because I can't control it. And if I can't control it, I can't turn that switch on. I don't do that to my family. I think my family should have the opportunity to. In moderation, in controlled, and in a controlled fashion. So I don't do it, but I, they, they can do whatever they want as far as that's concerned. But I try to make sure we have healthy options that are available so that we don't have to have, so they're gonna make the better choices for themsem their, themselves for the long run, for the long haul. Okay, knowing that, I really do need this other pan to work. Soy and garlic. And okay, let's talk soy, shall we? Because I, I got strong biases about just about everything in life. Um, I hate most of the soy sauces that are on the market. Kikamun's really sucketh out loud. You can quote me. Um, if I'm gonna use Kikamun's, you have to cut it. You have to cut it with some water because it's just too intense and too salt, has too much salt. I use Aloha Shoyu. Aloha Shoyu is from Hawaii. It, is, um, it used to be in Macy's stores. I don't think it's there anymore. I, think, I, I, I get mine at Chow's. And Chow's is an import store down on um, University Avenue in, in Provo. Um, 
and it's, uh, I buy it by the gallon. Um, and Aloha Shoyu is what they call a sweet soy. There's not sugar in it. It just means that, that it has less intense soy sauce uh, flavor. It's, and it's also lower in sodium. I like both things, those things about Aloha Shoyu. So that's the one that I use. Um, I soak it overnight in that with some water. Because again, even though Aloha Shoyu is less intense than Kikkoman's, I still would like to have a little less um, intense soy sauce flavor. All right. Any, you can, any kind of garlic you want. You can do any kind of garlic. I can repeat that three times, but it's any kind of garlic you want. Any kind of garlic you want. I use, I use a pre-chopped because most of everything you can find in the store that's a pre-chopped that you're not having to do yourself is really quite great. Um, it's going to it's going to lose a little potency compared to if you're doing it for, from fresh. So I'd add a little bit more and be I'm okay with that because I didn't have to chop it. Hello, give me strength. All right. So we're going to go ahead with that. I still need to let that, let, let that cook a little bit longer. Um, um, having said that, when I went back to the doctor about six months after that, I ended up losing, I was 320 pounds and I ended up at 178. Is it no, no, no. That, that was over a year. It took me over a year for that. Um, but I also got too thin. Um, 178 was what I weighed in seventh grade. It's not a weight I could maintain. And it was not good for me. And so I actually found out that it was better for me to be somewhere between 190 and 200 pounds. That was more optimum, optimal for me. Okay, how did I get there? I told you it was that evil thing, exercise as well as controlling what I was consuming. And I have an aunt, she's struggled with weight all of her life. She struggled with a congenital issue, a hereditary congenital issue with her back. So is my mother, so have I. We have an extra disc, it has, it's not attached. It floats whenever it wants to. And she went and had it operated on. Because she had it operated on, they fused it. She, no longer, she has major issues with her back. And she said to me, Mike, I really want to lose weight. I want to get be in, in better health, but I just can't exercise at all. Everything I try, I can't do it. I can't do a treadmill, which I agree with her. I think treadmills were for, made from Satan. Um, I like an elliptical machine. It's easier on my joints. I can tolerate it a lot better. So find what works for you. I think people who jog on the streets are stupid. I'll tell them that out my window. Or I'll have my children open our van door and see if we can't hit them as we go by. <laughs> but that's up to y'all. If you want to be a stupid one, you go be a stupid one, okay? But I found out the elliptical machine worked for me, okay? And that's what I, and I still use my elliptical, and, well, it's not mine, it's right here at this hospital. Um, um, I, I like the elliptical machine. But my aunt said to me, I can't do a treadmill. And she couldn't, her back won't tolerate it. I can't do even an elliptical. I can't do a stair stepper. Walking she can do for, periods of time, but it's also more difficult to her. So she just said, I can't do anything. I said, I have to tell you something, Aunt Fontella. What a stupid name. I'm, I need to talk to my grandma sometime about that. <laughs> She's dead, so I'm going to have to wait a while. But I said, Aunt Fontella, I have to tell you you're full of crap. She said, what? And I said, Aunt Fontella, can you do this? How stupid are you? Of course I can do that. OK. Can you do this? Yes, I can do that. Can you do this? And do it faster? You can exercise. We can come up with any excuse we want to to not get the results that we need. So either come up with excuses and just say, cool, I'm an excuse giver, or shut up and be honest. And honest means that we, make, we have to have control over what it is that we do in life. If we're going to be kind of the kind of people that never want to accept responsibility and turn it over to somebody else all the rest of our existence, good. But just acknowledge that that's what you're doing. Because we have the ability to control. We have the ability to control. Sometimes we lack motivation. I got that. I ended that 320 pounds. But that doesn't mean that we don't have control. All right, so whatever. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'm going to pull this out and see if we can get it, uh, the rest of it done over here. All right. Having said that, we're going to keep on going with this recipe. Take control. What I'm saying is, don't use excuses. Take control of what it is you need to take control of. OK, rest this recipe. I just have people that work for me that are really rock. And Bob Anderson, who's my catering supervisor, is the one that cut up all this stuff for me, which is really good, because I really hate the cutty part. I'm really good at it, and I'm fast. And when I'm with my, my wife and I are cooking and stuff, I do it because she whines if I don't. But um, <laughs> these are pea pods, and I love pea pods. They have great flavor. You know, she oh, these are these are snow pea. Absolutely, same thing. 
So we're going to add some snow peas, sugar snap, whatever you want to call them. I'm going to add some mung bean sprouts. Mung bean sprouts, I had people say, yeah, but they don't have any taste, and the only taste they have I don't like. Cook them with something. Mung bean sprouts take on the flavor of anything else you're cooking them with. And then the other aromatic, we're gonna add, the, we're gonna add some carrots. Yes, ma'am. Um, when it looks like it isn't, it sings to you. If I'm doing it from raw, which is usually how I do it, it's a, it's a, it's, it would take a little longer than that. And I, I would pull it out and I'd just test. Um, but since it's already cooked, I just need to warm it up for y'all. That's the difference right now. Okay, I do want the extra protection from heat here because I want to make it cook more rapidly for you. If we weren't doing this and we didn't have any time constraints, I wouldn't put a lid on it at all because I want to only have the benefit of having that heat sear in what's happening with those veggies. But we need to get this done so y'all can try it. So I'm, gonna, I'm putting a little lid on it just to keep the heat close to it, okay? Which then causes it to steam, which is no longer stir frying now, it's steaming. Just making sure you all are t totally plugged in right now. I know it's still early for y'all, but we want to make sure you're all plugged in. Okay, so um, that's, that's the first thing. We're, as, as soon as this part's done, we're gonna, we'll rock and roll with it. But I'm gonna, I want to start something else for you. When I, um, and I teach a lot of, of career classes um, for junior high and high school students. Please, if y'all you have people in middle, middle school, would you tell your children not to be idiots? Kids in middle school are idiots. I t my children, I've done it at their school several times. I said, if you walk in, you act like an idiot, I will kill you in front of these other children so that they know that there is a potential that they could die if they act like that, you know, they're going to act. But um, I, I want to kill little middle school kids. Bless their hearts. I know they're just going through all this stress. Life. I don't care anymore. I just don't want to deal with them any longer. Okay, we're going to start, we're going to make a breakfast wrap. When I teach this to middle school and high school kids, I tell, I, we talk about the importance of um, successful strategies in life. And I always ask them, I always say to them, okay, we're gonna, we wanna make sure that you eat breakfast. My own kids know this is always available and they eat them a lot of the time. A breakfast wrap because they can grab them and run to the bus with, with the, the breakfast that they had to or they can go to their stupid friend's Jeep. Th Sunday, that's a kid I will kill, is a kid with a Jeep. He is a dumb kid. Anyway. I have it available so my kids will make their own. They like to play with it a little bit. And I'm gonna tell you, there's something, I have def I, you know, strong biases, okay. There's part of this that my daughter modifies to her own way. And I will talk about that and I'll tell you why you should never do it, all right? But she love it that way. Okay, we're gonna start this breakfast though with a whole wheat tortilla, 98% fat free. Why am I using a whole wheat tortilla? When I ask a question, this is the part now that you get to participate in. Huh? what'd you said? High fiber, and why do I care about fiber? Pardon? It can, well, it can. There's, there's a couple of things that we want to make sure happens. Usually when I ask this to high school students, they'll say, I say, why do we start with the whole wheat tortilla? They say to me, because it's good for you. And I say, yeah. I teach little seven, seven-year-olds in, in, in church. And when you ask little seven-year-olds any question in church, they raise their hand and they say, teacher, the answer is Jesus. It doesn't matter what you ask, that's what they're going to say, it's Jesus. What am I going to say, no, Jesus isn't the answer? Of course he is. So when I say we're going to use a whole wheat tortilla, don't tell me, oh, it's because it's healthy? Duh, that's the Jesus answer. Okay, I'm using this because it is high in fiber. It also is a complex carb. And because it's a complex carb, it will stay with me longer. Why do I care about the fiber? Because it helps us poop and we are all, all enough, uh, full of enough poop that it's probably time we do it anyway, okay? So that's the reason why I start with a whole wheat tortilla. Whole wheat tortilla, and then I'm, I'm gonna add to that some peanut butter. And peanut butter has what that I want? Protein. protein, and I want protein because that now gives me a little extended burn, doesn't it? I have the complex carb that's gonna help get me further along in the day, and now I'm adding some protein to that, which will also. Okay, what do I need to be careful about whenever I'm consuming? Protein, almost always. What else are you consuming? Fat. Fat. And so we just want to make sure we acknowledge it. 
Like I said, there's no such thing as evil food. We just don't want to overconsume. Okay, nice little thin layer of peanut butter. Okay, then we're gonna add to that some honey. Okay. I love this part of this discussion, usually with my high school students, because I, I can sucker every single one of them in on this one. I set them up. I, what did I do with my chow? Thank you. Um, I can sucker every single one of my high school students in on this particular question. Um, Um, honey. Is honey better for you than, than sugar? Let's vote. You made us afraid to answer anything. I know it. And I, and I just told you I set you up, didn't I? Okay. Your body takes in sugar. It breaks it down into glucose. It uses the energy or, is it stores it, or it stores it as fat. Your body takes in honey. It breaks it down into glucose. It uses it as energy or stores it as fat. What the crap's the difference? because it's natural they're both natural products Overconsumption of both of them is not good why is there an advantage to using honey on an occasion than there is sugar Mindy they're not gonna answer me you have to answer it flavor. flavor and oftentimes it can be sweeter right that means I can use a little less right but it's the same and since it's the same we're gonna make sure that we don't overconsume. why am I using it then that evil food no it tastes good hello shut up and it's a heck of a lot easier to spread on top of peanut butter than granulated sugar is. And I don't want to use too much. I just want a little flavor there. Okay, I also like to tell my, uh, uh, tell my little high school students or my middle school students. Okay, um, so why is it that we want to make sure we're getting breakfast? We often hear, and they, they, can, they can just bark this right at me in two seconds. It's the most important meal of the day. Well, yes, that is. Why? Make it, number one, I knew you guys are just too smart for this one. Yeah, it's to get your metabolism going. Your body doesn't have the permission to start burning unless you give it permission. It will fast and will tell you, tell you I'm not, don't worry about it, dude. I'm gonna actually give you some food. Just start eating now. As soon as it understands that, you're in, you're in much better shape. Ooh, we're getting close on this one. Okay, so after I have that, then I'm going to add some bananas. We're going to almost get the basic four on this. We're not going to do broccoli. It sucks for breakfast, I'm telling you. <laughs> but the rest of it we'll get. Okay, I also want you to know that um, there's only one way, in my opinion, to eat fresh fruit. And that is... It needs to be um, apportioned properly. You know, the whole world, this is the number one educational issue that I have when I'm teaching people about anything that has to do with good eating, is that they believe that just because it's fruit, it's just a freebie, isn't it? You can just consume as much fruit as you want. There's lots of great things about fruit, including fiber and everything else, but the biggest problem is, is that there's also a lot of calories associated with it, natural fructose. So I try to make sure that people understand. This is why, the way that you should consume fruit. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just taking all that freedom right away from you. I'm just telling this way it should happen. If I have a banana, I can hork it down. Or I can cut. If I have an apple, you ask my wife, I do it. I'll cut it into 32 pieces. Because if I consume this in that amount, and I take my time to enjoy it, it's as much flavor and banananess, that's a word, by the way, as it is if I hork it down. That's the way you learn to enjoy fruit. You're not going to overconsume. If I have an apple, I cut it into 32 pieces. I enjoy 32 pieces of apple. I don't hork it down. The other thing that we do that, I, that, that is irritating now to me, that I was famous for, is consuming 
Okay, when we go to the grocery store, we shouldn't go hungry, right? We all know that. Why? Impulse buying. All that crap that they have right by next to the register that you would never have purchased otherwise, whatever we would have, but what, not, not as much. Um, that's a problem. But the biggest problem there is you're going to also probably purchase something to eat on the way home. I, loved, I used to love to go shopping with my wife when, when I wasn't really concerned about what I was eating because we'd buy the little box of three haagen bars because I knew I could get two down before <laughs> she could. That's what I loved the very most about it. So making sure that we're, we are going to the grocery store already satiated means that we're not going to do things like that that are going to make us want it. So it's difficult. If you're a busy person and you're on your way home from work and you're going to stop at the grocery store and hurry and get something for my family, I get that. I understand that. Make sure, however, that part of your plan is that I have a plan when I go shopping. You won't overconsume, you won't overpurchase, you won't all those things that, that become part of the trappings of shopping. All right. We now have the fresh fruit on this. Um, the next thing I'm going to add, and this is usually the thing that I get most of these kids with the very most. Um, I'm going to add some trail mix to this. Is trail mix good for you? You guys are so good. Because they always say, oh yeah, it is. It's really good for you. It's natural. It's whatever. Okay. This particular trail mix I like because it doesn't have a lot of sucrose that's added to it. A lot of sugar that's not, added, that's not an add-on. However, getting old sucks. I glasses out. This, has, this container has 15 servings in it of 144 calories a piece. 15. One fifteenth of this does. Okay, what's the problem with trail mix? Do you eat one fifteenth of it? No, we eat the whole dang bag, don't we? It's open. So unless we're separating that out and, become, and make that a, a great strategy for us, then we have just overconsumed. I'm telling them, I'm adding it to this, not because it's an evil food, because there aren't any evil foods, because we like the taste of it. We like the texture of it, and I want that in here, but I just don't want it in huge quantities. All right. Next thing we're going to add to that is some Nabisco shredded wheat. <laughs> Most of my middle school and high school students have no idea what this is. I'll say to them, you know what these are? No. I said, you know those little baby ones you call spoon shredded shredded wheat? You eat those. This is the mom and daddy that gave birth to those ones, okay? Um, and so, Nabisco shredded wheat, again, a whole, wheat, a, a whole grain, right? Complex carb. I mashed those little mothers up. Okay, if I put this in this, just like this, y'all are eating twigs. It's so not, not a pleasant way of handling it. So I'm going to add some vanilla yogurt to that. Well, if I have a spoon, I'm going to add some vanilla yogurt to that. Don't tell me I just dirtied my only spoon. Oh, no, I got one over here. Vanilla yogurt. Um, you can use light, which is what, the way I do it. Okay, what does my daughter do um, that, is, that I tell you that is just, <clears throat> for me, intolerable? Oh, this is a light. This is light, you'll play. Um, she uses, she likes to have, um, she likes raspberry or strawberry yogurt, cool, light. She uses light, 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 light yogurt too. She likes Cheerios, so she adds this to Cheerios. Okay, I'm telling you don't do that. That's sick. Uh, have you ever given a Cheerio to a child and they stick it inside their mouth and they spit it out? What's that Cheerio like? It's a booger. Can we talk? You put Cheerios on this that have been mixed with yogurt, you're eating boogers. It is sick. It is bad. It is not good. I have to, the first time I made this, my little seven-year-old, he's now 12, but the first time I made this, my little seven-year-old said, Dad, why are you putting tuna fish in that? <laughs> it looks a little like tuna fish. I got that. So now we have dairy in there as well. I told you we're going to get our basic four. Well, almost our basic four. Yeah, it's not my plate, and I'm not dealing with my plate, okay? All right. Okay, I'm using a huge tortilla. This is big, okay? You're going to make this usually on an 8 inch. Isn't that what your recipe calls for? Okay, and how many calories is that, your recipe? 400, isn't it? With uh, flour, 
Yeah. How much is it with the whole wheat? 390. Okay. 390 calories for breakfast, and this breakfast will get you to lunch without you having a snack in between. It's filling. Huh? If you eat the whole tortilla? No, you're going to just suck everything out of the middle of it. Of course you're eating the whole tortilla. <laughs> No, this is a lot because this is a bit, this is bigger than an eight inch. This is a much, this is a 12 inch tortilla, okay? So I'm saying it's not exactly the same. We're going to speak slower for you for the rest of the time, okay? <laughs> oh yeah, this will. Mindy, can I get your help for a minute? Yeah, would you grab that basket too of, of so they can have a napkin there and you know you don't have to have this large of a knife to do this, but it is way better. It's so much more impressive to have that big of a knife. Well maybe. Well that one's not gonna make it. Did I make enough? What I like about this recipe is, first of all, it tastes good. Because I don't want to put something in my mouth just because it's supposed to be good for me. So it tastes good, first of all. Second of all, it will get me to lunch without me needing a snack in between. But if, the, if we're needing to plan for those kind of things, do you ever have that, that 2 o'clock or that 3 o'clock in the afternoon kind of feeling that you just... You, your lunch is kind of starting to burn off and you're just starting to feel a little run down you need something else. So plan for a snack, hello. Don't try to make it so you won't because then you will overconsume. But you overconsume at dinner. You're going to overeat because you're so starving you're just going to hork it in. And by the time you finally figure out, oh, I've just eaten most of dinner and it's taken this amount of time, you've overconsumed. So plan for a snack. My, one of my favorite snacks there is, for me, is jerky. First of all, I like jerky. Second of all, Jerky, I can buy in a four ounce package. I can separate that out because I'm smart enough to move that jerky into four piles. I can, get, I can understand what an ounce is. It's easy for it when it's only a four ounce bag. When I have an ounce of jerky, that's 80 calories, good snack size, and I have to chew it. It gives my mouth something to do. I know, I've tried swallow it whole. It gets caught in your throat. You don't do that. You have to actually chew it. And how, how does it taste? It has great flavor. It's not dried out. That yogurt helps it a ton. It's not dried out. It is filling. You eat one uh, eight inch tortilla that, you're not gonna need to eat no, nothing between breakfast and lunch. It's a good size. It is filling. And if you use the right products, like a whole wheat tortilla that is 98% fat free, it is also actually really quite good for you. And this is about ready to roll. Okay, now, we need to finish this recipe. My veggies are done. I'm adding back in the meat. Now we need to do some other things. I'm going to add a little teriyaki sauce. You can use any kind you want. This is a Kikkoman. I just don't want to use very much, because I don't want this to be all sugar, all right? But I need the flavor, so I'm just going to add just this. Look for that whole batch. I used about, about a two teaspoons, maybe, maybe a tablespoon of it. That's all I used. Now I'm going to add some rice wine vinegar. Why rice wine vinegar versus a white vinegar or an apple cider? This is called a sweet vinegar. Does sweet mean it has sugar? No, this means that it's less intensely flavored than you would of those other two vinegars, all right? And I need that because I need, the, I need the dichotomy of taste here, the sweet and the sour together. You can, uh, you mean at the very beginning? Well, you could have as, 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 as your base, and the, but just make sure you get your hot in some other way. But I actually have a, a, um, a sesame oil that has chili in it. That, I like that one a ton. Okay, then we're gonna add to this. Oh no, I don't wanna do that yet. Um, I wanna get this hot enough that I'm gonna let all those natural liquids, and they're there, are gonna be present in the bottom of this, okay? 
those natural liquids that are coming from the chicken, that are coming from the vegetables. Um, I don't want to lose those. If I pour off those natural liquids, now the chicken at the beginning of the cooking process, I, I do get rid of them. But if I'm heating it back up, then I don't get rid of those because that has a lot of your flavor in it. All those aromatics that I cooked in the beginning that I wanted to make sure sweat so you weren't getting a raw aromatic, I want all of their liquid. I want all of their natural juice because that natural juice is flavor. But I don't want it to be in that form where I'm going to have really sloppy, grody. Th That's another thing they do with at PF Chang's is they tie everything up you know there's no runniness for the most part on on their lettuce wraps and that's because they're tying it all up like i'm going to okay if you all um let me ask a question how many of you were born or raised in utah okay i need to learn you something right now then okay because i don't know too many utahns that have not been taught this and i just want you to i wanted to tell you that your mamas were good ladies and your grandmamas they were just not smart <laughs> Oh gosh. Um, when I make gravy, can I use cornstarch? No, it's not a gravy. That's what I'm going to teach you right here today. You'll know the difference even though you were raised in Utah, okay? A gravy is made with flour. It has to be cloudy in nature or it's not a gravy. It's a glaze otherwise. And that's what, tapi that's what tapioca or, um, tapioca or cornstarch does. It makes a clear glaze. That's the reason I can use it to make fruit sauces, you know, or, or uh, pancake syrup, or I mean, we have lots of things that we can use a clear sauce for, but a lot of dessert glazes are all that way. When you were raised in Utah, you were taught that, a tap, that um, cornstarch makes gravy. Not all. Most Utahns I know, that's true. Of. I know my mama was raised in Utah. My mama is just not, well, she was never good at cooking. No, she had a bunch of children. There were seven of us. And she was always on a tight budget, so she did everything that she could that was the best, but I didn't learn anything about food from my mom. <laughs> when I was as chef for, the, uh, for, for, for Brigham Young University, I'd get a call every once in a while in the kitchen and say, Mike, there's somebody on the phone that some older woman wants to talk to. <laughs> it was always my mom asking me a cooking question. <laughs> always. They'd say, Hold, that's your mom calling? I said, yeah, she doesn't know how to cook. She never did. Um, she, bless her heart, my favorite meal that my mama ever made was her spaghetti. I loved her spaghetti and meat sauce. I loved it. And I remember we were, one time, I'm gonna add a little bit of cornstarch to this. I want you to know what I'm doing right now. So I'm tying up those natural juices, but I do want it clear. I don't want it to be cloudy, therefore I'm making a? Thank you so much. See, even though you were born and raised in Utah, or born and raised in Utah, you were a quick study. That was good. All right, um, my mom and daddy, they were taking us to this Cub Scout banquet. And I was all excited because it was going to be spaghetti. I love spaghetti. And we're going to get there, and I, it just did not smell right in that building. So my mother, I said, it doesn't smell like, she goes, it's spaghetti, Mike. We're gonna find. So then this plate of spaghetti-ish stuff came to the table, and they set it in front of me. I said, I was tapped. What is this? This is not spaghetti. My mother and dad both looked at me, shut up and eat it. I was just... I was just wanting spaghetti. I just, my mother looked at me again. She goes, this is spaghetti, just eat it. So, um, how did, what was I accustomed to spaghetti being like? My mama would put one can of cream of tomato soup, one can of cream of mushroom soup, and a taco, a shilling taco packet to make her spaghetti sauce. Oh, it went a long way, but it was not spaghetti sauce. But that's what I loved. That's what I loved. So then when I got a little more educated in my, in my own palate, I told my mother how much I loved her and appreciated all that she did for me, but she sucked as a cook. <laughs> she acknowledged I was right. <laughs> no, I just have to make them for her now. And it's usually something that I bake. No, my mom, my mom had really had issues with her health also. Um, she had arthritis horribly. Um, it was so debilitating that she had to, she couldn't get out of bed. And even laying in bed, she was in pain. Um, and she needed to do some things that were drastic, and she tried a bunch of things all at once. Um, she went to a naturopath, and she was doing a lot of herb therapy, and she was, she no longer would eat white flour, she didn't eat any white sugar, she didn't, I mean, she went through all these things. I do not know what affected her positively, but she doesn't have arthritis today. She doesn't have any debilitating pain at all. 
she attributes to some, she has, she feels like she knows what it was and that's lovely. Uh, but because of that, she is a 100%, oh, well, she eats 80% of what she eats is raw. Raw on all of her vegetables. And she, 80% of what she's eating in a day is going to be raw. She will eat some meat, fish and chicken. But I'm always getting a call from her. Could you help me with this recipe for this? Or can you help me cook with um, honey? So when <laughs> I'm telling you about my feelings about honey, I got to tell you, it starts at home for me because my mama still thinks this is better for you than sugar. Um, so uh, I said, but I'll help her. Yeah, I can, write, I can help her make, put together recipes for breads or for whatever she wants in that way. Um, and I do not know what worked for her, but something worked. Something worked and, made, and it made a, a, a huge change in her own life. It's too bad it didn't happen when I was young. <laughs> well, that wasn't nice, was it? I'm adding back, back just a little bit of that natural chicken juice that was on the, that I cooked in. Does it? I don't. Uh, yeah, and I, I am so un, I am so un, um, perfect on that because I just add it till I, it's going to tie it up, but not be gummy. I do want to make sure it cooks clear. Or you can taste the cornstarch. And we don't want that. Okay, this is done. What I need you to do. Y'all are gonna come up here. Come on. Don't be lazy. Get your butt dust out of the chair. Come on. No food exactly. Okay. There is. It's much more difficult to do it the way I did it, but we'll talk about that. She just asked me, um, where did I go to culinary school? I didn't. Um, when I graduated from Brigham Young University, I graduated with a degree in Food Systems Administration, Hotel Management, and Restaurant Touring. Um, it is a, it's a management, uh, it's a systems degree. You learn the systems of food. Um, and I really wanted to go to culinary school at uh, Culinary Institute of America, which is back in New York City. Well, outside of New York City in Hyde Park, New York. It's the number one culinary school there is in the nation. <clears throat> My wife had graduated from BYU in... Um, illustration. Um, she had a BFA in uh, children's literature, illustrating children li children's literature. She, um, so we were going to go back to New York. She was eight and a half months pregnant. Not a good time to run off to New York before we already had that child, first child. So we decided, uh, I, I just graduated from BYU, and so we decided... Um, I'll it. Okay. So I don't think it occurs all right. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Okie doke. Um, so um, BYU, who I had been a student chef for the whole time I was at BYU, um, had a job that opened up as a chef's, jo a chef's job that, that opened up. And they offered me the opportunity to take that job um, because I had already been doing all those tasks for them. Um, it was only attractive to me because the, at the time the only certified chef in the state of Utah was there and he was going to be my supervisor, my supervising chef. So I could apprentice under him. And if I go through apprenticeship, then I could go and take all of the same tests that a educated chef, um, a culinary educated chef takes, and I can certify. And if I certify by taking those tests, then I have the same educational background considered as the, as the chef did that went through culinary school. So I did that. Um, it was a great experience. Um, I got to cook for every LDS general authority there was. Um, I got to cook for the Queen of Thailand and later her daughter the princess and ambassador from South Africa and the president of Venezuela and the consulate general from Brazil. She offered me a job. I should have taken that one. My wife didn't want to go live in Brazil. Go figure. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so um, it was a good, it was, that was a good route. I learned a lot, but I also learned what I didn't ever want to do as a chef or as a manager. Uh, first of all, I have friends that are chefs in resorts and bless their souls, but they're married to their jobs. 
I wanted to be an institution. I wanted to be in an institution because you actually have time away from it, and you don't have to be working when everybody else is playing. Um, uh, you, if you're a chef and you're a, worth your salt, you work every night, you work every holiday, you work every weekend. When y'all want to go play, then they're going to be working. And I have friends who do, who have done that. All, every one of them are divorced. Every one of them have issues with family um, because they're married to their jobs. I don't want to be married to my job. And I took, um, so I did that at BYU for four years. Um, I, I liked it because it gave me an educa the education that I needed. I got the certification that I needed as a chef. Um, I also learned what I didn't ever want to do when I was a boss. Because my supervising chef, oh, how do I say this nicely? He was, he was, a, butt, he was a butthead. <laughs> No, he, I, on a Christmas day, Christmas day, he had me work a 12-hour shift making crepes for 12 hours on three six-foot grills. I'd pour a grill, I'd pour a grill, I'd flip a grill, I'd pour a grill, I'd flip a grill, I'd take one off, I'd pour a grill, I'd flip a grill, I'd take one off for 12 hours. No, 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 I had a half-hour break in the 12 hours. But I did the rest of it for crepes that we didn't use there, that he froze and sent someplace else. On Christmas day, what did I learn from that? I never wanted to be a butthead when I was an executive chef. When I was made his boss six months later, <laughs> oh, I had fun. <laughs> I called him and I said, I have this great trading opportunity for you. It's called Christmas Day. <laughs> it's called Three Six Foot Grills Making Crepes. After the color returned to his face, I took the opportunity to train him on how, how absolutely ridiculous it was that he did that to me. Um, I learned a lot for making substitutions, however, that had to do with health because he was all plugged into that. At the time, that was very rare in a chef. They weren't trained to care about what was happening with health. They were trained to care about what was happening cooking-wise and taste. That's what their whole function was. He was not. He was plugged in a different way, and I like that about him because I learned a lot about substituting. I learned a lot about what it is you can do in a recipe or can't do in a recipe in, in, in the way of substitution. Um, I mean, I was working at most of, the, most of the time in the Missionary Training Center hosting international guests, they were always wanting me to substitute something in a recipe that didn't have any alcohol in it. Go figure. Um, so I learned a lot about making substitutions in, those way, in, in that way as well. Um, I just think that if we learn to take control, we do better in life. Take control. Mindy said there's lots of places you can go look for recipes that are healthy recipes. And there are, cha there are things that we can make that are choices that are healthy. Mindy's heard me a million times say this, and so I'm going to give you my strong bias as far as fat is concerned. We spend too much time, in my opinion, trying to discuss healthy fats versus unhealthy fats. Kentucky Fried Chicken came out with this big, huge um, marketing campaign to tell you that they Fry with trans fat free oil now, and it's so much better for you to eat that gallon of fat laden chicken. It's okay to eat it now because I don't have trans fat in our fat. <laughs> if I'm eating a gallon of oil, it doesn't matter if it has trans fat. We spend too much time in that, in, in that arena when, re when really our number one strategy has to do, be reduce fat overall, consume less fat. If I'm an individual who needs to really concentrate because I have an issue with cholesterol or some other issues, I'm making sure that I'm also addressing those other fat issues, which most of us are going to struggle at some point in our life, then do make a choice. Don't make the choice to, eat, to use butter. Make the choice to use uh, canola oil. Make, your, make a choice to use olive oil in your cooking. That's, that's cool. I like olive oil because I love the flavor of it, but I don't like it in cookies. <laughs> I'm going to use butter and then consume less cookies. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I just think we need to make smart choices. I would rather speak with somebody about reducing fat in the way that they prepare foods or enjoy foods than I would about making sure that we're making every single great choice relative to the fat. Because we tend to use that as an excuse to consume the, continue to consume the fat. If I'm going to eat a gallon of olive oil or if I'm going to eat a gallon of butter, I'm not in a good way either way. I'm in a bad way. Now if I need to make a choice between using butter or an olive oil in a recipe. And I have issues that I need to reduce fat, but I also have issues with cholesterol and, and I, and, or flavor, then I'm going to make a choice that's going to say, yeah, I'm going to reduce, and I'm going to do it by making a, a smart choice in, in my use of, of fat. Okay? What questions do you have of me? Anything? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Uh, would you change any of the stress pitch you were doing wild game? Um, yeah, I wouldn't do it. No, I hate, no, I have to tell you, this is my, again, my strong bias. I hate wild game. There's not many, there are not many animals that are wild that I like the flavor of. Um, a gentleman that I work with, he's my catering supervisor loves, he loves venison in any way. I've had people tell me a million times, I can cook venison in a way you can never tell it's venison. I walk into the kitchen or the house, I know if they're cooking venison, I don't give a crap how they're doing it. Maybe because you're, you're peaked on that too. Totally is because I hate the flavor of it. Totally it is. But I like, okay, the, I can tell you, not a game, not a game meat, but one that is gamey to most people is mutton. They don't like mutton. A lot of people will, can tolerate lamb, but they, I love mutton. It doesn't bother, as long as I can get rid of the fat. And usually that's the problem with most game meats and with most um, uh, strong flavors of, of that nature. It's the fat. And if you get rid of the fat piece of that, which is hard to do in, when you're talking venison or elk or, or because there's so little fat already. Um, if you can get rid of the fat, though, you've got, you've, you are able to get rid of a lot of that intolerable flavor. And that's my deal with mutton. Mutton, I like the flavor, of, but I've got to get rid of that fat to be able to, to tolerate it. I don't dig duck for the same reason. I don't, it's so fatty and it's, um, it has a gamey flavor, but it's mostly, again, associated with that fat. Whereas I love goose. It has the same kind of issues, but for some reason I'm just more tolerant of it. Uh, it's something I like a lot more. But there are some game I love. Um, I mean, buffalo technically is not game anymore because it's raised in a different way, but I love the flavor of, of, of buffalo. I like most elk for the very same reason, and moose. Moose is, I would challenge somebody to be able to tell the difference between that and beef if cooked properly, because moose is so good. But, I, but venison, no, the worst animal I've ever put in my mouth is pronghorn, pronghorn antelope. Oh my gosh. God shouldn't have given us those animals, unless they were just, unless they were just for the coyotes. <laughs> and let the coyotes have them. Because I hate it. No, I, I, I had, a, I had a, a church leader who told me that he had the perfect recipe for pronghorn, pronghorn antelope. He said, you take a nice little steak of pronghorn, and you put it between two cedar shingles and you put it in your oven on the two cedar shingles. He said, and then you throw away the meat and eat the cedar shingle. It's better. <laughs> and he was right. I just think that's, that's a horrible piece of meat. Horrible piece of meat. But no, other than that, there's, yes, ma'am. Do you have a question? Oh, I'm, are you done with this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what kind of soy sauce did you use again? Aloha. Aloha, uh, L-O-H-A, Aloha Soyu, Shoyu. And it's called Shoyu, S-H-O-Y-U. Yeah, and I like, they also have, there's actually down, if you go down to Chow's, they also have four or five different flavored soys that come from China that are out of this world. They are fantastic. Chow's? Chow's, it's on the west side of the street, uh, west side of University Avenue in between Center Street and First North. It works there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was tofu. It was tofu. I cut it into cutlets, I breaded it, I fried the sucker, and put the Parmesan sauce, Parmesan sauce over top of it. He had no idea he was consuming tofu. When I told him, he said, I'm checking it from now on then, Dad. I'm breaking it open. I'm checking it. I said, dude, you go, but I'll, I'll, I'll trick him every time. So um, what I convinced him of is that he's okay to now with trying some other things. And there are a lot of vegetables he didn't want to eat, but he'll try some other things because I've tricked him into eating them. Not very nice of me, but it's life. Thank you so much, folks. It was really nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you.